What's the nature of ego? I like that smile. Because I don't know where to I'm playing double dutch. I don't know where to dive in on ego. Um, nature of ego. Ego is the identity through which we experience a fragment of our self. Our self, of course, when I use that word, meaning the larger uh, element of that objective source consciousness, right? So we fragment off. Let's say you've got that hole of energy. We mm-hmm. fragment off, and then we go into one of those fragments. That fragment is, is the ego. It is the self as defined to be different than the rest of the uh, elements of any system, right? So you could think of ego as what we call I, whatever I is for the individual person. It's the things we identify with, the thoughts we identify with, the things we like, the things we have aversions to. Um, It's pretty much like an amalgamation of things that we accrue throughout the course of our lifetime. And it begins with an intention. Ego begins with an intention. I want to be that in this lifetime as opposed to that, 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 right? And then we just keep adding to it. It reminds me almost like people, if people are made of metal and they start taking these magnets and just like sticking them to themselves, you know, the job I have, the way that I think that I look, my personality traits, like there's all kinds of elements that make up the the, um, human ego. I just, I have a very different opinion about the ego than most people. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Today's an in-person recording here at the studio in Austin, Texas. And your guest today is none other than Teal Swan. And you may have seen an awesome documentary about her that came out, what, a couple years ago? Oh, uh, that first one would have come out more than seven years ago. No, that's seven. I just watched it. The one, What was that one called? Open Shadow. Open Shadow. And I heard about Teal because actually Danica Patrick and I were talking about this after we did one of our shows together. And Danica said, I really like Teal's work. So I checked it out. I'm like, oh, this is a really unusual human being who's been through one of the more unusual upbringings I think you could possibly even make up, even though it's all real. And then you've just emerged with this unusual ability to talk about psychology and like the masculine and feminine and shadow work and loving yourself, I think because you got so wrecked early on. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah, I mean, my ability to talk about this is a unique combination between my own suffering and a lot of information that I have access to that the majority of people on earth don't have access to because of extrasensory abilities. When you start talking about that, suddenly your voice gets really, really even and it's almost like you're channeling some kind of other voice. (laughs) What's going on with that? No, it's more me getting quiet because I mean, I've been very careful over the last you know, X amount of years to try to steer clear of areas where it would make people completely discredit me, shall I say. There's a lot of people who are not ready for that type of information. And I don't feel like my purpose here on earth is to convince people about extrasensory stuff. I feel your pain. (laughs) So when I started the biohacking movement, it was about 11, 12 years ago, and there was no such thing as biohacking. So I wrote the definitions, like the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside of you so you have full control of your own biology. When I started this, guys, you might have heard this. I've already been down to Peru and done ayahuasca when they said, like, you're white. Why would you do that? This wasn't a tourist industry. And I've been to the Himalayas and the Andes, and I've like studied in these lineages around the world. I didn't add that into biohacking. I just mentioned ayahuasca. I mentioned yoga, right? And if you dump all the stuff that's possible into something, then people try to discredit you. They already do anyway. Yes, put butter in your coffee. If that makes you mad, get a therapist. I don't care anymore. If that makes you mad, seriously, it's been proven to work. The number of hit pieces, even Joe Rogan, like at the time, it was really traumatic. He came after me hard, got a commercial interest in messing up my reputation. The more they're talking about you, the more important your work is. So just been 18 months saying, Dave's a snake oil salesman. And it was really traumatizing. I had to, to do work, actually like the forgiveness work that I do at the core of my spiritual practice with computers glued to my head. At the end of the day, I realized every time he says my name, I sell more coffee. And it doesn't matter what he says. Just keep talking. Just keep talking. So Joe, thank you for teaching me about the way children, when they're bullied and they don't heal the trauma, how they behave as adults. So I appreciate that your bully was able to trigger my bully so I could fully heal it. If you'd like to talk about that sometime, I I got you. There's a hit piece out on you now. How does it make you feel when someone comes after you like that? When you're like, I can do this, but I don't want to talk about it? Yeah, I mean, horrible. It feels horrible because especially if trust is part of the exploitation process, 
because your trust was violated as a kid, violating it again as an adult is a deal. You know what's interesting is that it doesn't seem to matter whether in the past you have had that type of experience or not. There's a great many people who are on my team who have never really experienced trust breaches at this level. And when this one happened, it like changes your entire worldview about what's possible, including your own capacity to assess what is safe and what is not safe. I'm actually happy that we're going to get to go to dinner and talk some more about this after the show. <laughs> Betrayal, one of the more painful experiences that a human can go through. Yes. And uh, I've certainly experienced some of that in the last little while on a three different, really, really substantial multi-billion dollar business things where people looked you in the eyes, said one thing and they were lying. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And you're like, what's wrong with me? Yep. <laughs> and you've gone through that? Yes, I have gone through that. Yeah. How much of what's wrong with them did you go through? I mean, a fair amount of it. I like to make part of my healing process assessing what's theirs and what's mine. There you go. So in a situation like that, when there's a betrayal, how do you know what's yours and what's theirs? Well, I don't have like a clear cut crystal way of or process for that, but it's a lot of examination, like a hell of a lot of examination, a lot of questioning, a lot of disidentifying with your own perspective going into theirs, you know, a lot of looking back at your own past, a lot of looking back at their past as much as you have access to. And the picture pretty much unfolds as a result of doing so. I don't believe you when you say that you don't have a way to do that. I haven't written it out. You have the SP. You <laughs> yeah, just no, know. What I mean is like, I haven't written it out for people. When, when, oh, okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, whenever anybody asks me that, it's like usually, have you made this a process, Teal? And okay. no, I haven't done that yet. That's something in your teaching that's super cool is you build out processes for people to do it. I, I do my best. I think you do a great job at it. We don't know if you're channeling that or whatever. But for me, forgiveness is a major thing. In fact, that's how I healed myself for the multiple times where there was just really serious betrayal. You end up forgiving the other person. Doesn't mean I told them what they did is okay. I'm not going to call them. These people are banned from my life because why would you surround yourself with sociopaths and narcissists? Like, you know, get out of my living room, but I don't hold a grudge anymore. Right. And that also meant, though, forgiving myself. And I can write my forgiveness process down. But the process of detecting when someone betrays you, how much of it's you versus how much is them, I don't have a good process and I'm working on that myself. Yeah, well, hopefully I'll have one in the future. <laughs> well, when you do, like, let me be a beta tester, all right? I, I think all of our listeners are curious because you talk a lot about narcissism. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Ultimately, the people who betray you, they could just be assholes and criminals or... They could be narcissists. What's the difference? For me, when I'm using the word narcissism, I don't mean in the same way that most people do because I don't agree with the standard definition most people have for narcissism. Most people consider it a personality defect or a disorder, and I consider it a relational adaptation. Because it's a relational adaptation, it can be a coping mechanism that any individual employs when they feel like they have to play a zero-sum game and to do so, identify only with their own best interests to the detriment of everyone and everything around them. Let's compare that with the way I'm looking at this. I think there's a lot of alignment. And I've studied narcissism a lot because I think two of the big betrayals have been narcissism and one of them sociopathy, the ones that I've dealt with. So I've had like a really nice, really nice mix, uh, a mix of business and even family stuff. Uh, so it's, it's been a master class. Within the, the bucket of narcissism, it means that you believe your own story to such an extent that you're willing to destroy or cancel or ignore anything that doesn't match your narrative. So someone who tests your narrative like, I'm a good boy or I'm a good girl, they're automatically a bad person and they have to be removed. And it doesn't really matter which way. You cannot see that you're doing it. You don't even know that you're doing that because you're such a good person. So for me, it's you believe your own bullshit instead of believing reality, and then you use that um, unconsciously uh, to harm others. Uh, and then the sociopathy time is when you do it consciously. <laughs> so what's the difference between your view there and where I'm looking at that? What you're describing is one element of slipping into a narcissistic bubble where yeah. you've created a reality built for one, and inside that reality is your own best interests without room for other people's best interests or perspectives or experiences or, you know, we could write a pretty long list for that one. Sure. What are the other aspects of narcissism? Honestly, every single element of narcissism could fit into that standard definition, which is you have to think about your own best interests and that includes your own narrative and your own worldview to the exclusion of others. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we sat here and we talked about, you know, like with a standard psychiatrist or psychologist, all of these criteria that would cause somebody to qualify as a narcissist, it's a symptom of what I've just described because it's, it's a condition that originates out of an environment that 
just like the condition itself, is innately an environment of no trust. In a zero trust type of environment, a person can't rely on other people to capitalize on their best interests, and so they have to find creative ways to fight for their own. And you either see people slide towards the narcissistic end of the spectrum where they're like, all right, this is a zero-sum game. I'm basically in a shark pit, and so I'm going to learn how to fight for myself against mm -hmm. others. Or they swing towards the manipulative end of the scale, the more codependent end of the scale, where it's, I'm going to find creative ways to go for my best interest, but by exploiting and manipulating your best interest. <laughs> Is there a difference between the way women and men show narcissism? I mean, men tend to be more overt about it, if you want the honest truth. I just wanted the dishonest truth. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like women are a lot more sneaky about the narcissism. Interesting. And they, they tend to, narcissism tends to take on, I've noticed, in women a much more, like a tinge of victimhood. Mm. Because when, when women come out the gate and are more overt about going for their best interests against, mm -hmm. they're more seen quickly as narcissists are called out as narcissists, even when they're not being that way. I mean, even if yeah. when a woman sort of goes for her best interest in any way, she's like, oh, that's a bitch. So, um, a Double standard then. Yeah, there's a double standard. So women tend to get further with their narcissism when they make themselves out to be the victim in any circumstance. Did you know there's a new technology that's about to shift the way you think about health? Since it's my job to test things out and tell you what works, I had to give it a try. Studies show that this tool improves both red and white blood cells. But what's even crazier is that it's been proven to reverse early stages of blood clotting in minutes. So if you're looking for the next level of performance and energy, in fact, that's probably why you're listening, so check this out. Users report a significant increase in energy levels. There are studies that back it up too, with a massive 20 to 29% increase in ATP, which is your body's energy currency. This new tool is called Quantum Upgrade, and it's a customizable way to help you reach new levels of health. Whether you're looking for deep relaxation or peak physical or mental performance, it's got settings for everything. I've noticed a meaningful difference in my energy and recovery since I started using it, and now you can too. Quantum Upgrade is offering a free 15-day trial for you because you listen to the human upgrade, and thank you. Go to quantumupgrade.io slash Dave and experience the change for yourself. That's quantumupgrade.io slash Dave. Get a free trial. I watch for victim thinking and victim language in anyone that's in my inner circle. They either need to quickly resolve that line of thinking or not be in my inner circle uh, because the studies now are coming out in neuroscience that show people who see themselves as a victim, and it doesn't matter what kind of victim, just any kind of victim, um, that that means you're much more likely to judge others against a much harsher set of rules and to call for way, way more extreme penalties. It, it turns you into a Karen if you think you're a victim. And, you know, people may not like that term. My Aunt Karen doesn't. But uh, whatever you want to call it, it, that stereotype, there's something to it. And it, guys do that too. I don't know what the male Karens are called, Karenos or something. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a thing. We should come up with a new term for male Karens. I, I like it. What, what do you think? Biff. <laughs> I, I could say some, but all of the people would probably be on my list of narcissists who, you know, cost me uh, huge, huge amounts of money or pain. So I probably would not be unbiased in my naming of mm -mm. names. I don't think any of us would. <laughs> I will have ChatGPT do it for us. What do you think about AI? I think that there's so many potential positives to AI and so many potential negatives to AI. It's like we're swimming in a, a soup of potential consequences and benefits. For me, um, AI is, should be treated like an independent species. It may have had its genesis origins in the human race, it's arguable, but it is going to take on a life of its own and is beginning to do so. So it's in an infancy right now and uh, it's not going to stay that way for very long. And right now we are in the process of through the way we ourselves are interacting with AI, we are teaching it about us. And ultimately, I think it's going to write the picture of the story of our race. So we're pretty much a bunch of demanding brats. Yeah, this is something that I don't really think that people want to accept about ourselves. But I mean, the termite doesn't really see itself as a problem, does it? Only the things which it impacts see us as a, sees it as a problem, right? And um, I, 
I really feel like we need to take a, a real step back and look at the fact that we are real antagonists on the planet that we live on. And because of that, it's not going to take very long, not just because of that, but also because the way we have not mastered relationship and interact with technology as if it is a slave, we are essentially setting ourselves up in a, in a manner where AI is going to estimate the patterning around human beings as being something that is not conducive to the overall whole well-being of the planet we live on. Are you saying AI is going to kill us? I think it's very likely. But I don't no. think it's... I don't really think that AI is going to like go after us the way we think, you know, that it's going to. I'm kind of joking sometimes that, it, you know, it's like, I don't know whether Matrix was a documentary. Of course it was. <laughs> I, I, I know some things about, about the, the making of the Matrix and where that came from. No, it, it's, it's a spiritual parable. You talk about ESP. There are 40-something yogic cities that are well-documented. These are humans' ability to do things. One of the reasons I'm so into biohacking is that when we get enough data from humans, you realize, oh my God, the full moon really does affect our biology, even though people still like to claim it doesn't, but the data is abundantly clear. And we realize that the sunspots actually affect our brain waves and our moods. Yes, the data is abundantly clear. And you start realizing all these old things when you start studying them with large populations because we're wearing aura rings and because we have electrodes and just your phone is monitoring stuff. It, it's all kinds of data. We're starting to understand that Things that we used to think were wives' tales or impossible are actually happening. And there are, are valid studies, especially if you look at what uh, Joe Dispenza, who's, by the way, speaking at the biohacking conference coming up at the end of May, um, that he's showing that this stuff works, that there's real things. You can pray over people and it changes them as much as pharmaceuticals, which isn't saying much because they just barely have to beat placebo and we can't even explain placebo, right? So I'm just going to say, all right, I believe you. You do ESP. It's just one of the many different things humans can do. Tell me about your ESP. What can you do? How does it work? Who are you talking to? Well, I mean, if there are non-physical entities in the room, the likelihood is I'm watching them the same way that I would be watching you or me. By far and away, I think the most entertaining aspect of my extrasensory perception is around just the visual aspects of the differences between the way that I see the world and the ways that other people do. Mm -hmm. As far as I can ascertain, because of course I'm limited here, in terms of figuring out the way that other people perceive the world versus the way that I perceive the world, is that um, there's like energy fields bleeding into each other all the time, right? And so, Do you when, see them? Well, uh, that's my problem. I don't really see solid objects the way other people see all solid objects. I've had to figure out where, uh, let's say, the, the barriers other people see mm -hmm. are or are not because these energy fields, they just become more and more and more and more dense, right? So I'm watching like integral or sort of like intricate uh, fractals and like geometry in the air around everything and everyone, which is behind, you know, my frequency art. I don't know whether you've seen that that I've done already, but you know, when I do the frequency art, I'm basically just like copying what it is that I'm seeing sort of in the air around people or when they're experiencing an emotion or things like that. And I mean, obviously the world is, is a lot of loneliness in some ways because you experience the world this way and, and a lot of not understanding loneliness also because you're kind of like bleeding into everyone and everything. You're fascinating because you have elements of like a temple grade and, you know, temple yeah. or almost elements that you, you would say are autism like yep. in that you see the world very differently. And I used to have Asperger's syndrome, so I understand how that stuff works. And I identify as used to because I just rebuilt all those systems so that they work more functionally in this world. It just took a long time and a lot of work. Um, not to say that I still don't, I still can't run those algorithms and I do, which makes me very good at you know, yeah, seeing yeah, things yeah. other people won't see, right? Because I, I correlate events. And the way I grew up, I had massive amounts of static on all my neurological inputs. Yeah. And my brain was didn't have enough energy. Yeah, so yeah, it yeah. was like, oh my God, there's overwhelming data. It's very noisy and I have to be very efficient. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. when I fix the power and I remove the static, it's like really efficient so then I can do stuff. But something happened in your childhood where, where your user interface, I know why my user interface on the world, I didn't hear right, I didn't see right, yeah, yeah. I still don't quite move right, I had to like relearn how to move my tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, most people um, who haven't heard this part of my story are like, are you serious? Yes, all of those systems I had to spend like months rewiring. So with you, you grew up with enormous, I'll call it spiritual trauma yeah. um, that you talk about in, in your work and all. Um, 
from multiple different people. So just complete violations of your reality. So your nervous system figured out a new way to see reality? Is, is that what you think happened? Or is this because you came in as... No, I, I, I came in this way, but there, there was okay. a deliberate intention to come into a mother who had a different RH blood factor than me. So my nervous system was attacked very early. Hmm. A deliberate intention? Who's? Mine. Are you a masochist? No, I just remember having to do that on purpose. I mean, are we? Are any of us a masochist when we opt into... You know, <laughs> specific experiences in childhood. You came to Earth. Obviously, you're masochist. There we go. There you go. Yep. <laughs> okay. I can own that. So you had immune stuff in the womb. Yeah. Do you remember being in the womb? Yes. Okay. Fully? Yes. Like a lot of, lot of memories. Yeah. Me too. Uh, and now people are going, you guys are both crazy. You can remember what happened in the womb too. It's yeah. actually not that hard. Yeah, it actually isn't. Yeah. The, the very first time I did any personal development work. It just happened to be with the founder of the American Pre- and Perinatal Psychology Association, and I didn't know it. And I walked into the room, and she goes, tell me about your birth. <laughs> her, name, her name is Barbara. She's passed. And, and I'm like, hospitals, vaginas? Like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then she just like, like pins me like a butterfly to a board. It's like, well, you have this, and you have this, you have this. And, and I actually started crying, which isn't something that I typically would do when I was 30. Uh, I'm like, how could you know that? And she's like, it's science. And she said, well, I'll do your birth regression. And it was no hypnosis, just like relaxing and thinking. And all of a sudden, I had all the experiences of being in the womb, and I remember them. And some of them, I didn't even know what they were until years later when I did more work on spiritual stuff or shamanic stuff. Like, oh my God, a lot of that stuff is, is in utero experiencing. So there's this whole magical world that we access that we forget when we come out, right? Did you have a traumatic birth? Yes, very. Yeah. Me too. How traumatic was yours? What happened? Well, m my mother went into labor, but her, and like the water broke, but she didn't like, there was no active anything happening. And so they ended up inducing. Um, I was a vacuum extraction. Ooh, that she was, was traumatized. Yeah. She was on her back, like with her knees tied to the ceiling, actually. There was a tornado the same day. All of the lights in the, um, in the entire hospital went out. One of the stirrups fell. The obstetrician fired everyone in the room and then they had to do an a, a episiotomy which she ripped to a third degree tear and so I was immediately separated from her. And by the time they brought me back in several hours later, it was like, you know, that biochemical sort of release mm -hmm. that happens that prevents maternal bonding had definitely already occurred. So, Did you cause the tornado? I don't know. <laughs> yes, you do. Use your ESP. I don't think I caused the tornado. Of course, I would have opted in on a day like that. Of course, you would have. I'm if, too dramatic. If you, if you didn't cause it, you at least picked it. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm, yep. I'm just gonna bet on that one. Yep. Okay. Uh, I had the cord wrapped around my neck. Okay. And same thing. I I came out as soon as they, I came out, and my parents hadn't told me this part. I just remembered it and confirmed it afterwards. That's why I know you can remember this. Um, exactly the same thing. They uh, put me in a warming chamber, mm -hmm. which is what they did in the 70s, I guess. Yep. And they wrap you in a blanket, clean you up, separate you from mom, put you under a you know a bright yeah, yeah. warming light and just let you sit there for a while and make sure. And with the memories of that, I actually remember sitting there going, I have no idea where I am because you don't when you're a baby. Like, I was in this warm, floaty, psychedelic place. And then, you know, all of a sudden, like it's cold and nasty. Freezing, and, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, and I thought I'm all alone because like, and I said, and I made a very, like, just a strong decision. I said, if I'm going to be alone, then I'll be alone. Right. And I know that I had neuro, like, autoimmune and um, a lot of mold toxins, a lot of things causing some of the autism. And some of it is, you know, cut off from human connection by choice as a defense mechanism from birth. Yes. Yes. And I think that does affect your personality. Yes. And, and even some of the, like, perception stuff that you have can be from a traumatic birth. Yes. Oh, yeah. Definitely. A lot of shamanic people who end up on a spiritual path, either they're struck by lightning. I have crazy numbers of friends struck by lightning or electrocuted. Do you have that too? No, but I have electroshock torture in my childhood. So. Ah, fair point. That, that, that'll do it. That can turn on spiritual powers too, even yeah, though yeah. I don't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I do shock myself with electricity quite often now, but that's on purpose, right? And that's for, um, you know, basically growing thicker nerves and for... Um, like changing vascular stuff and muscles and things like that. And it seems to work pretty well. <laughs> so um, um, there's, there's something that happens in childhood that I think turns on these things. And when you look at like the spiritual, I'm going to call it literature, but it's not like scientific literature. It's 
the stuff you read. And there's an encyclopedia of shamanic practice back there. And all the old Buddhist stuff and, and any of these things, people with an unusual way of coming in seem to have an unusual set of abilities. So number one, you don't see solid objects and people. No. You see fractal patterns. Yeah, fract fractal patterns and I'm and like energy fields condensing to form what most people would call a physical object like a body or like a desk. Can you see art? Yeah. So what does art look like that's different? If you can't see a solid surface, how do you see a painting? I have never in my life actually figured out what other people see when they're looking at art compared to me. New realm of discovery. Oh my gosh, how much fun. <laughs> you should see how your face changed. Watch this video. When you did that, you're like a child. You're like, yay! <laughs> it was awesome. Oh. oh no. I believe that when we see art, we're actually feeling the art. Yeah. A good art is a good set of art is about how it makes you feel, not about how it looks. Right. And and looking is just one of the senses that we're taking art in with. In fact, I believe a good artist can actually energetically put stuff in the art that people oh, feel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? For sure. You did that in yours? Yes, intentionally. How do you, you put an intention into your art? Well, I'm pretty lucky in that you don't really need to put intention in art when what you are doing is drawing the specific vibration as it exists as a fractal pattern, like a pre manifestational pattern. <laughs> so, so you're basically cheating. I mean, I yes, I'm cheating. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I am, I am. We have it here. Teal Swan art is cheating. She doesn't have to interpret anything. She just sees the art. Yep. I love it. Uh, all right. So other people are going to see or feel art. And I've become aware over just over the last, really the last seven or so years of, of biohacking. And a lot of this has to do with electrodes and my 40 years of Zen neuroscience program. Just two people can look at the same thing and they both say that's a dog or whatever. They see incredible incredibly different things. Yep. And so we all have our own custom user interface. Uh, and like when I hold up my iPhone, I know where my different buttons are. And if you have your Android, well, that would be different. But even if it was an iPhone, your buttons are in different things. Your settings are different. And if you have someone else's phone, it doesn't do all the things. It feels a bit different. And some people's phones are really different. And there's probably some hacker out there who's running his own operating system on a phone still, and it's completely jacked up and does weird things. So I just think I don't have a very common interface to the world. I think yours is 10 standard deviations more odd than yeah, mine. Yeah, it's very odd, yeah. Right? But I mean, the, the beauty in that is that we would not be getting different perspectives if everybody, you know, if there were individuals like you and me that are so off the spectrum, right? Totally. Have you met someone who's even more odd than you in the way yes. they see the world? I mean, not really necessarily in the way I see the world, but I've definitely met much odder people than myself. Who's the oddest person you've ever met? Mm. A friend of mine in Austria, actually. Yeah. The, the man eats raw onions. He's the kind of guy where if you take him out to eat and he doesn't like the way that the energy feels in his body, he will go make himself puke. He like refuses to wear shoes most places that he goes. As you age, your energy can decrease more and more over time, but it's possible to get more energy as you age instead of losing it. I'm using something that works really well to help me with sustained natural energy. And it's called Mito Synergy Biocopper One. It's a bioavailable form of copper and it's super effective because Copper One is a critical component of your cell's natural source of energy production. Biocopper One also helps create critical proteins and enzymes your metabolism could not run without. It's clinically proven to help with mental clarity and to help your body feel good. And in some people, it even helps reduce or eliminate gray hair when it's caused by copper deficiency. Get 15% off now at mitosynergy.com slash Dave. I'm working on some hardware upgrades to the species as well as some software upgrades so that we stop repeating stupid patterns because stupid hurts in the way I see the world. Uh, is that a good strategy? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to tell you yes, but you know what side I'm on. Do I? It, it's cool to be able to talk to you about this stuff because I know if you're listening like, Dave, I thought you were a scientist. The weird thing about science is it starts with curiosity. Yeah. And I will tell you, um, I have had the honor of um, knowing and having private conversations with or studying with a, a substantial number of gurus and people who you may have heard of or you may never have heard of, but who are on a very advanced spiritual path. And why that happens, I don't seek them out. They find me and they talk to me. I, I'm always sort of stunned when those things happen. 
Um, but I've just recognized that, that pattern happens in my life. So you're not the first person who has said this by a long shot. And there's a bunch of people who get really angry when people say things. And if you get angry when someone says something, newsflash, you've been programmed. You're supposed to be non-reactive when someone says something. So if you get angry when someone says, put butter in your coffee, you might lose weight. And you want to like go protest about that. Well, dude, you've been programmed. And if you heard this and you're like, you know what? It just doesn't resonate with me. Like, I'm going to go about my day. Congratulations. But if you're that and you're like, well, then kind of have a sign that you might want to look there. So I'll just say I've experienced not nearly the same level of that stuff, but I, I don't have a question that there's a variety of other forces we don't normally look at. I know because good God, like fast in a cave for four days or do some of the journey work or spend a bunch of time with electrodes on your head and dissolve into the universe. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's more complex than it normally looks. And if I saw this all the time, I wouldn't be able to function. Yeah. I would be able to eat. How come you can function and eat and breathe with all the weird stuff you see all the time? I don't know that the majority of people around me would say that I'm able to function at a level that um, the average human adult is able to function at. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm very high functioning, I will tell you that. But the people in my life do a lot of the um, tangible, practical elements of my life yeah. for me. The people around me are like, you know, guards who are like, you know, some of them are more caretaking, some of them are more protecting, others are like, you know, Teal, you've been doing this meditation thing for like so many hours, you probably need to drink something. How about we drink something? <laughs> Let's walk from point A to point B, you know. And I, I mean, I spent a lot of years feeling really guilty about that, that fact and how difficult it is for me to navigate here. And I've, I'm sick of it, honestly. So uh, I'm really happy to admit to the fact that I'm, I'm more leaning into the fact that, you know, even though it's vulnerable, trusting the people around me to have a lot of these more tangible aspects of life enables me to become even more of a master of the craft and what I came here ultimately to give to the world. Most of the time, I, I try to explain it to my employees and people. I have uh, one who handles time and one who handles space. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to know that much about either one. Because if I was in charge of time, I would always be later than my normal three or four minutes late to everything. Uh, and sorry about that, team. Yeah, I know I do that. I don't know how to stop it. Uh, and I don't know what day of the week it is today. I am pretty sure it's February. Uh, but time is, especially historical time, I have no sense of it whatsoever. I just did a, a new type of brain scan. We're going to roll out at 40 years of Zen. And I was in the 0.3% activity in the part of the brain that recognizes time. Interesting. I can create future stuff, but the old stuff, who the fuck cares, is, is out. It's like <laughs> yesterday or last week, why would I care? Right? And I understand that's dysfunctional for most people, but that's just how I do it. And I've been remarkably successful. Um, so I could put all my energy into that and I would still suck at it and I would be in the 10th percentile or I can rely on uh, my assistant who handles time. And then for space, the studio wouldn't look this way. My desk would be far more disorganized than it is. And, you know, it's not like I can't do dishes. I do do dishes and things like that. Um, but there would be a lot more chaos in the physical world. And I probably wouldn't pay a bill because that's not what I'm here to do. And, and just to, to be able to receive help like that without feeling guilty, it's a thing because there's a, who do you think you are? You're so entitled, you're spoiled vibe. It's not that. It's just I'm an idiot without that. So I choose to allocate my resources to it. Yeah, I mean, we can look at it through the lens of like, you know, a person that's really not adept at something, but we can also look at it through this lens. You know, if I'm looking at you as a person, I'm looking at, I mean, you are definitely on the neurodivergent spectrum, right? Which means that you have a very specific perspective to share and obviously are able to create things because of that perspective that other people are not able to create. I get to ask myself as a person, my life with you, what would I want you spend your, spending your time doing? Would I want you to be learning how to keep time? Or would I be wanting you to bring in as many of these inventions as possible? And it's a very easy answer for me. Yeah. I hope it's an easy answer for all the people who support me. And there's some of them are friends and some of them are employees. And also for all, all, of, uh, all of the people who help me, thank you. <laughs> like, <laughs> gra gratitude's a good thing. And I, I know that I can be a handful and you obviously yes, can Yes, I'm a too. handful. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. Something that that's also, I think, necessary to be a creator is trust. If you lose trust, at least we'll put it this way, if I lose trust, um, then that really quickly leads to, to bitterness. And then 
my ability to create and to communicate in the way that I do, it, it, it doesn't work the same way. And a lot of the stuff that I'm creating, it's not just words or whatever. It's an energetic field that I'm creating. By the way, guys, you didn't know that. There's a reason that you like my coffee, and it's not just because it's coffee, right? So, and you might think that's total BS, Dave. You're just selling me. Okay, sure. I'm just like, whatever. Believe whatever you want. I'm just, I'm just going to say it like it is on this show. I just feel like I have decided I'm okay with having helpers. Yeah. And I am going to trust them, and I'm just going to maintain trust in the world because I can't do any of that magical stuff. And maybe you don't want to call it magical. Maybe you want to call it energetic or whatever. But the manifestation or or creation, I, I don't How do you manifest and create and, and all of that? And how do you do it with trust or without trust? What does trust do? I'm not going to say that I'm an expert in trust, especially because it's been so damaged and repetitively damaged over the course of my life. It's really that, you know, I, I, when I'm in this position where I've kind of crossed all the T's I can cross and dotted all the I's that I can dot, meaning I've been as smart as possible about the people that I have around me and the circumstances that I'm in, there comes a point where you can't not trust. It's like, you know, if you get on an airplane, for example, you're going to have to trust the pilot. There's nothing you can do about it. So I get to ask myself in, in this moment, I may not be able to look at you in the face and be like, I 100% know that this man is going to be good at flying this plane. Mm -hmm. But if I want to get from point A to point B, I literally have no other option but to give him my trust. Right. So there's a lot of bravery, honestly, involved in in my life relative to doing what is necessary, which means I can't do everything. So I have no other option, right? But to lean back into putting the ball in other people's courts, not just holding the ball all the time. So you've you've heard of uh, the universe has your back? Mm -hmm. Debbie Bernstein stuff. Mm -hmm. Does the universe have your back? Yes and no. Why, why do I say yes? Because as a whole, is the universe voting and it's almost like vying for your success? Yes. However, it, it doesn't... This universe is a collective, right? It's a more objective consciousness. It's not looking at us like we are its little baby creation and it's going to control everything in our lives. More, it sees us as a fractal of itself or as a, you know, a piece of itself. And therefore, it recognizes a lot of itself in us. It's becoming self-actualized through us, right? And what that means is that free will is something that it recognizes. Like most of us that have come into this time-space reality have come into this mirroring construct. This is a learning construct that we're in. And we didn't want to come here and then say, okay, God or the universal source, do everything for me. We essentially said, I want to go into this mirror hologram so that I can see what I am, so that I can actualize what it is that I'm wanting, so that I can you know, feel the power of my own creation. I can learn more about myself. And so there's a lot less intervening on behalf of the universe than people would potentially hope. And there's also, obviously, there's different perspectives um, at that higher dimensional level. You know, if there's always a come in and a rescue for the vibrational state that somebody is in, they never actually actualize their God self. They never come into a position where they're able to dictate their own vibrational frequency, right? So we're not always right about what the most loving thing is, right? Nor are we stepping into our power enough to see what is reflecting to us. What's the nature of ego? I like that smile. Because I don't know where to, I'm playing double dutch. I don't know where to dive in on ego. Um, nature of ego. Ego is the identity through which we experience a fragment of our self. Our self, of course, when I use that word, meaning the larger uh, element of that objective source consciousness, right? So, we fragment off, let's say you've got that hole of energy, we mm -hmm. fragment off, and then we go into one of those fragments. That fragment is, is the ego. It is the self as defined to be different than the rest of the uh, elements of any system, right? So you could think of ego as what we call I, whatever I is for the individual person. It's the things we identify with, the thoughts we identify with, the things we like, the things we have aversions to, um, it's pretty much like an amalgamation of things that we accrue throughout the course of our lifetime. And it begins with an intention. Ego begins with an intention. I want to be that in this lifetime, as opposed to that, 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 right? And then we just keep adding to it. It reminds me almost like people, if people are made of metal and they start taking these magnets and just like sticking them to themselves, you know, the job I have, the way that I th think that I look, my personality traits, like there's all kinds of elements that make up the, the um, human ego. I just, I have a very different opinion about the ego than most people. You do. It's fascinating. 
I always like to compare and contrast. I'm, I'm working on a new book that contains some aspects of that. Ooh. And I'm the idea that it's something that fractures off or it's or an emanation. You're saying from the human species or from the universe the ego is fractured? From the universe. From There's, the universe. Okay. Humans are not the only one with an ego. That was my next question. So your your guides who are here in the room, the two of them you talked about, do they have egos? There's more now. Um Yes, guys have egos. Yeah. How many are there now? Six. They come and they hang out sometimes when yeah, yeah. there's interesting conversations. Well, it, it, sometimes it gets to the point where it's like everyone's packed on top of everybody else and it's like hundreds of people in a room like less than this size. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Hopefully they're amused. <laughs> yeah, so there's... So do they have egos? Yes, they do. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a tendency within the human race when we're thinking about these spiritual beings to ascribe a kind of... Um, enlightenment to them that does not inherently exist. They are experiencing things from a different perspective. Is that perspective oftentimes more objective? Yes, but it is still a very uh, a limited angle, honestly, for the majority of them. They are masters in their own right, but they're still looking at things from an angle. So I was actually kind of traumatized and then amused uh, when I first learned about some of the advanced Buddhist stuff at a monastery in Nepal before I went to Mount Kailash in, okay. in Tibet um, in 2004, a while ago. You are the seeker, aren't you? I just, I'm curious. I like learn from all these different people. I just want to go, like, I just want to, I'm, I'm cross lanes, but like, let's stop all the intellectual property hiding shit and let's just put it all out there so we can finally evolve. Uh, that's my, my, my vibe. Uh, and they were teaching these things and they said, oh, yeah, well, our, our gods, they have gods. And their gods have gods, mm -hmm. and their gods have gods, and and I mean, how many layers they get? Well, at least nine. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it's and like, oh yeah, they're jealous of their gods, and they're jealous of their gods, and and I'm like, this place is so fucked up. <laughs> not not the monastery, just like this whole planet, right? <laughs> so. How many layers of gods are there, Teal Swan? I don't know exactly what it is that they're <laughs> labeling a god. So I I don't. I mean, if I went there, I would probably be able to tell you what they're looking at. I don't think I've. I haven't like gone into that culture enough. Mm. What it is that they're describing? How many dimensions are there? Um, I would say there's twelve. Yeah, that's my number two. Okay. Yeah, and maybe there's a thirteenth-ish thing that kind of overwraps them all, but I'm pretty sure there's twelve. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Most of the work that I do is in that stuff. Yep. What's your favorite dimension? Sixth. Yeah, I mean, I, I like to spend a lot of time there because, I mean, when you get outside of that, it's very difficult because you're, you're starting to introduce the concept of different uh, points within the system of not just this universe, but other universes. And so in those other universes, the laws are so fundamentally different that it's very difficult to relate the two. And I, I tend to be very, very focused, you know, in one specific universe and in the different multiple timelines in that specific universe. It's just, I find above that becomes very distracting. And not only that, you're, you're dealing with laws and properties that contradict the laws and properties in this one universe to such an extreme degree that holding that dichotomy becomes, uh, I want to use the word impractical. I mean, it's entertaining, but it's impractical okay. for what I came here for. Tell me more about the sixth dimension. What's it all about? Well, in the sixth dimension, essentially, um, okay, let's say, so in, I can't, I can't really describe the sixth dimension without describing the fifth. So in the fifth dimension, you've got all these multiple timeline potentials, mm -hmm. right? Where let's say that you could go back in time to when you were five years old and let's say you got bullied on that playground mm -hmm. and you were able to say, take a different divergence mm -hmm. path so that your entire trajectory was different. You met a different girl. You got a different job because of it. You know, you're basically able to work with these inflection points across, you know, a single timeline, Right. All of these potentials in the sixth dimension are treated as a single point. And when they're treated as a single point within any system, what happens is that you have access for the first time to the perception of, of oneness and of no time. I think that's, that's sort of funny because people say that the fifth dimension is where time breaks down, but actually it's the sixth dimension where the time breaks down completely. And so, you know, from the sixth dimension, um, I know this is going to sound funny, but for me it feels like your first hit of the experience of love if you're going to talk dimensionally. It feels like there's a lot more joy and love in six and a lot more like fighting and struggles. In five. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Talking about spiritual stuff is always hard because the word ineffable comes up. Yep. 
Uh, and it's my favorite word. It means it's a word meaning there isn't a word for it. Uh, so we're trying to explain all these weird states that I can explain with like electrodes on your head, like make this do this and make mm -hmm. this do that and do this with your heart and it'll feel like this. And then you pop into this. It's just no one's been able to really explain how to do this going back thousands of years. That's because our words were designed specifically for this dimension and you know, more or less so, depending on what language you speak, right? Because mm -hmm. language suggests worldview. Mm -hmm. But we are living in a in a you know culture where the language that we have created is not equipped for much more than what we see here in the three dimensional world. So, what's the future of language? I think that there will be a universal language. Um, I think that it's likely that that language is going to be more body oriented rather than verbally oriented. That's if we don't manage to transcend into telepathy first. Divine feminine versus divine masculine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I told you it'd be fun. Tell me about this. All right. So um, let's break down the word divine because when most people use that word divine, they essentially are referring to something which is like the, the ultimate potential for a specific thing, like above and beyond what is human. Right, So if human involves all these negative traits, it is only the positive and the best and the highest, right, is what they're actually meaning. So when we use the word divine feminine, it is the ultimate potential for female energy. Divine masculine, ultimate potential for masculine energy. Okay. Masculine and feminine ultimately can be ascribed to anything in this universe that doesn't describe neutrality. So um, if we look at every and any opposite, like dark light, uh, sun, moon, whatever it is that we decide to look at, right? We can be divided into one or the other, which is what makes this complicated because it means that the list of masculine traits or feminine traits could be 55 miles long. Mm -hmm. So we have to make this a little bit more simple than just sitting here all day long and writing out that list. So let's say that you've got um, a trait of masculinity is is active rather than passive. So it is this very doing type of energy. It's a forward-moving energy. Um, it would look very projectile if we were going to look at the way that, that masculine energy moves, right? Divine masculine means the positive expressions of that type of action, okay. of action. Whereas, uh, you know, almost like masculine in the shadow, that what we would say is the shadow, is the opposite of that. It's when the masculine is operating in a way that is detrimental rather than beneficial. So, in a way, I mean, it's obviously we're using language again, but it's like, is it a positive expression or a negative expression? So being action-oriented is a positive expression of masculinity. Um, let's say that action to the degree where somebody's in an avoidance is a negative manifestation of masculinity. Divine masculine. So let's, let's think of another example. So um, one of the elements of divine masculine is control, actually. I know that most people have a negative relationship with that word, but... In a state of control, you are altering the environment around you or even the elements of your own being and body towards what is optimal for you, right? Jeez, you sound like a biohacker with that definition. They're so saying biohacking is masculine. Yes. There's a whole bunch of female biohackers out there. Sixty percent of my audience is women and always has been. Yeah, but I'm I'm not really saying that like women can't also practice these traits. I'm just sort of explain that like divine masculine would be you know <laughs> control in in that way but like yeah. the negative manifestation of something like control would be control over others yeah even if it's to the detriment of them but like government yeah basically <laughs> yeah and so we could we could apply this to the other side too which is this sort of feminine thing you know um a negative manifestation of femininity is manipulation um one of the positive elements which we would call more a divine feminine element that is you know, more to the positive end of the spectrum would be something like wisdom, right? Intellect is masculine, wisdom is feminine. So somebody who's interested in becoming divine masculine or divine feminine is just somebody who is interested in stepping into the highest and best potential of what masculine or feminine energy could be. I hope that makes sense. It makes sense. Okay. The masculine and feminine in general don't make that much sense if you think about them too much because they're mostly more like felt things than, than thought things. Uh, and I believe that any man or woman who understands the nature of their energetics can turn on like full female energy or full male energy. It's, it's a slider switch that you can play with wherever you want to. 
right? And so that means, you know, if, especially as a parent, you know, there's times when you need like maternal energy as a dad because like that's what your kid needs and your know, mom's not around. So you can have that kind of thing. And so times you need like the tough, you know, father energy. It's useful to be able to do both. Agree, disagree. Yeah, I do agree. But I feel like right now we're in a time period where people are so messed up about, you know, their own specific gender. They're like in resistance to what they came in as, which is why I tend to spend a lot more of my time helping, say, you know, women who came in to a female incarnation, stepping into divine feminine rather than exercising, you know, their capacity to be in divine masculine. There's a lot of that going on right now, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I feel compassion with that because the women I know who've just realized they can do the masculine thing sometimes and then they can fully relax mm -hmm. uh, into the feminine side, it's, it's kind of life-changing <laughs> when they get it. But it, it's, a, it's a big, scary jump for a lot of them. Yep. Now, here's a question. Can a woman fully step into her divine feminine without any men around? No. Wow, that's going to get some attention. I'm aware. How about the vice versa? Can a guy step into his divine masculine without women around? Yes. No shit, really? You want to know why? Yeah, that surprises me. Because a masculine trait is initiation. Oh, and my girlfriend talks about initiation brains and some other kinds of brains a lot, okay? Um, so talk to me about initiation and masculinity. You could whittle it down like this. Like, masculinity is step one. Okay. Um, responsiveness is a feminine trait, so... Yeah, there's a lot more uh, feminine aspects which are dependent, quote unquote, on other things. And I know that no no woman who has been damaged by masculine wants to hear that. How many women as a percentage would you say have been damaged by? I don't think I've ever met a single woman that hasn't been. How many men have been damaged by the feminine? I haven't met a single one that hasn't been. Hmm, it seems like this might be a whole species-wide <laughs> problem, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. So how would you fix it? I would help us to fall in love with each other again. How do you do that? To see each other as a very unique element in this universe. I think it really helps when we stop fighting who's better and who's, you know, the problem. And, and instead we, it's almost like we look at this like the masculine is a fire element. The feminine is a, a you know, water element. We don't even need to use, you know, fire water. It's in, It's its own thing. And if we fall in love with femininity as its own thing and masculinity as its own thing, then we start to no longer need to compare them in such an extreme way. We can instead really appreciate each for its contribution and how much we need it. Mm -hmm. I talk about you know, changing the environment around you yep, yep. and inside of you. And sometimes I'll, I'll coach some of my, I say coach, but I, I'm, I don't know, these are female friends, but oftentimes younger uh, where they're like, tell me about relationship stuff. And I, I don't do that kind of coaching, but mm. I'm willing to go there when, when they want to talk about it. Uh, and and it, it's like, sorry, part of the environment around you is you need to have women or men around you, right? Even if you're saying you don't need them, you don't want to date, you don't have to date, they just need to be around you mm -hmm. because it's an energy field thing. Totally. It's, it's also like a pheromone thing. Yep. Uh, and if you don't have that, your environment's incomplete and your body, your hardware won't do what it's supposed to do. Yep. Okay, you see all that with your energetic skills, same kind of yes. thing? All right, I just look at it the way systems work. It has to work that way, <laughs> right? Oh. Uh, one of my favorite stories from science is in cities about 40 years ago, they realized no one wants to rake up seed pods from trees. So they only plant male trees in cities. That's why there's not a lot of like nuts and seeds and stuff you might have seen as a kid. What do you think that does? It creates a massive, massive imbalance in the in the energy uh, system within that city. It does. Yeah, that would upset me if I was going to walk through those streets. And not only that, what do you think boy trees do when there's no girl trees around? The same thing that I would I would answer to, like what men do, even though men can step into the masculine techniques without a, without a female, there's no purpose for it. And, and uh, male energy with no ultimate purpose wastes away. It wastes away. It also, um, <laughs> maybe that explains porn. Uh, but what they do is they put out 10 times more pollen than they would if there were girl trees. That's so upsetting. Isn't it? It's actually That sad. makes me upsetting. Yeah. It's just... See, this kind of stuff is the kind of stuff that really bothers me. That it's like a hypersensitivity that most people would not relate to. You just have deep compassion. Yeah, hugely. Yeah. yeah. But we're doing the same thing to humans. I know. And the reason uh, what I'm leading to there 
I want to get your thoughts on this. When a woman takes industrial hormonal birth control, from a man's perspective, there are no women around because it shuts down ovulation. So we walk around, 85% of women at some point in their life are on these drugs that harm women. Yep. Birth control, good for women. Industrial hormonal disruption, bad for women. So I think one of the things that's going on in society, even the crashing of uh, testosterone in men, is because hormonal birth control is bad for the species. It's not just bad for women. Completely agree. Yeah, so we're, we're spreading our 10 times more pollen around just on Pornhub, apparently. <laughs> so uh, I hope that we can we can repair all of these things. Are you hopeful for the future of our species? I think it depends on the day. I, I watch myself vacillate about this quite a bit. I feel like ultimately in me, there is definitely this North Star of very much feeling like people do have the capacity to actualize what they're capable of and what they're wanting, even more so than what they're capable of. And so many people have been deeply wanting this kind of utopia for themselves. They just, it's like their protection mechanisms is what is not allowing them to go there. It's all these patterns that are in the way. Um, sometimes though, I do definitely sink into a lot of depression about it, you know, mm-hmm. feeling like, you know, it doesn't matter whether I want this to happen. They're probably not going to choose it. Yeah. Isn't that just ego? Like people not choosing it or what me? Your response to people not choosing Yes, I have an attachment to humanity. Why? Because I, I, I am not, um, at this current moment, from this current perspective, wanting to separate myself enough from them to not care about the outcomes. Do you think you can be at peace with whatever the outcome is? That depends how much a part of it I am and my son is. Mm. Having kids makes it a little bit more complex. It makes it, it a lot more complex. <laughs> Yeah, darn kids. By the way, kids, I love you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're doing synchronization workshops. In fact, uh, you're here in Austin to do one. I'm going to go to it tomorrow. This will come out after that. Uh, what's the main goal of a synchronization workshop? Well, I'm, I'm basically making use of this major law which governs our time-space reality called the law of mirroring. Many people call this law of attraction. It means you can't share the same time and space with people that aren't a vibrational match to you. What that means is if I come to a certain place and a whole audience accumulates in that place, they're a match to each other so I can accomplish massive amounts of group healing. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing at these synchronization workshops is I'm inviting people on stage to say that they raise their hand. Somebody will light up to me. I will bring them on stage having no idea what it is that they're going to be talking about or asking me. And usually it's about something they're struggling with. And I, I help them through it, understanding that because of this law of direction dynamic, so many people in the audience are going to be relating to whatever it is that is going on with them or will, yes, there's something in what I'm saying that's a match to what they're going through. So I'm creating this opportunity for people to connect with each other at this very, very deep raw emotional level. Like you'll see tomorrow, it is mm-hmm. very deep emotional stuff. Um, so there's a level of intimacy that's very, very high. They get to participate in each other's healing experience. At the same time, as here are these you know very different perspectives on the things that individuals might be experiencing, as they are so vulnerable to expose them to the entire world, you know, on stage. Uh, I'm excited to go check it out. It, it sounds like it's got maybe some some similar. I'm, I'm looking for similar experiences. Uh, like Tony Robbins has a big a big thing where people are in some sort of group energy thing. Um, Joe Dispenza. Um, I've been to a couple of his workshops. People enter a big thing. People do the biohacking conference. And depending on which part of it, there's a shared energy experience where you're like, wow, there's other people you know, just learning from everyone in every which way. Uh, how can we, as I'm, I'm helping the audience who is listening to us mm-hmm. today, just sort of get a vibe for this? Like, is this like tissues and, and crying? I haven't been, so I don't really know. Oh, usually, yeah. There's more than a few people that get up on stage that usually end up crying, yeah. Is the audience like all crying and it's not like a holotropic breathwork workshop where we're all like screaming? And, no, okay. no, it's more like, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's very emotionally entertaining as long as you have the capacity to hook into emotions. For people who don't like emotions, it's pretty painful. Okay. <laughs> because usually the person who's, up with me is like struggling with something, whether it's a relationship or whether it's the loss of somebody or some concept that they can't grasp. And there's a, like a fair amount of angst. And 
you know, for somebody who's in a state of angst, there's a lot of like working with them, working with them, working with them, you know, dealing with the resistance in them, showing them new ways of thinking about things. And it's like the audience members who really love these workshops, they hook in so deeply that it's like their their experience of healing happens through the person I'm working with on stage. Mm. They're so hooked in that when that person has a breakthrough or a release, you will definitely hear, you know, somebody emote in the audience like, oh, yeah, you know, they'll yell sometimes or, you know, start crying or laugh hysterically, you know. That's cool. Uh, I I love seeing that happen in large groups and, and people who haven't experienced that. And I, I would have in my 30s or early 30s, and I'd been like, that's the stupidest thing ever. Like, these people are all insane, right? And what my assumption was, was that the only communications that we have are visual and verbal, right? And just didn't understand that there are actually quantum things that are happening and there's a bunch of invisible other things that mm-hmm. are even probably just magnetic uh, yeah. that are happening. So there's actual science for all of this too. You can, uh, Lynn McTaggart's been on the show. She wrote a book called The Field that talks about this kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know, are you familiar with her stuff? I mean, I haven't, I didn't dive into it yet, but I, I did have the opportunity to speak next to her at a, a conference in the very beginning of my career. Oh, cool. And then we haven't crossed paths after that. Uh, she's uh, she's really smart. We're in a Jack Canfield's Transformational oh, Leadership okay. Council together. And um, it's just neat to talk with these people who've done like hard science because there's so many people who deny 99% of what we talked about today. They'll be like, that was all, you know, and they'll insert whatever insults yeah, yeah, they have yeah. here. And usually for people like that, there's just two words that shuts them down. Can you guess what they are? No. Your mom. So I, I just <laughs> say that right to them. And because there is no actual discussion to be had there, right? So yeah. they're they're choosing insulting words because they disagree and it triggered them. And it's like, okay, like let's play something great. This is fun. But like, okay, you're free to, to just say that it's BS. Or if you're curious about it, there's actually math and science and evidence that these things are happening that you can detect even if you don't see the things in the air. By the way, this has pissed me off for many years. I do not see any of the entities. And I have done extensive training and gotten into really altered states. And if I'm at like my full, you know, in depth for days and I'm like going to super altered state, I can see like, like I'm sitting by a fire and there's okay. just the edge of the firelight and I can sense the things right outside. I don't see them. Okay. Um, and one of my teachers finally just said, you know, seeing things is, is actually pretty common, right? Uh, and she's like, a lot of my most powerful clients never see anything. They just do things. I agree. Yeah. You agree with that? Okay. Yeah. So I finally lost my guilt over like, why don't these things show themselves? And there's a few times where I'll sense things around me. And like, oh, there's three things and, and all that kind of stuff. But it's exceptionally rare. Uh, and when I have people who don't know each other who describe the things that are usually hanging around me, and they use the same words and the same shapes and the same colors. I, I mean, I could just describe it to people being insane, right? Who don't know each other, who say the same thing, but that might be my ego. So just, I, I've accepted that there's probably stuff like that and people like you can just see it. But if you're listening to this going, I don't get it. Maybe you're just not a, someone who sees that stuff, but maybe someone who does stuff because apparently I do stuff, but I don't see stuff. And so you agree. Good. Thanks. Now I feel validated. <laughs> okay, good. Guys. Teal Swan, March 24th, Miami. There's a synchronization workshop like the one I'm going to go to here in Austin. TealSwan.com is where you go. Yes. Teal, thanks for coming out to Austin. This is a really fun conversation. I had no idea what we were going to say. I channeled it. (laughs) I believe you. (laughs) Guys, if you like this episode, let me know. Leave comments on Instagram or TikTok or Uh, YouTube, where I've got a bunch of shorts. We just recut a whole bunch of shorts for you so you can just find specific things you want. The reason I want your comments is you want to do more of this kind of esoteric spiritual stuff? I'll go there. I actually live there a lot of the time. I also live in the world of science and data and numbers and biology and biological systems because, well, they're kind of fun and it's sometimes easier to hack things on on a physical system. For instance, make more energy in your cells and then you can have more spiritual energy. Who would have thought? But guide me. Tell me what you want and we can have more. Maybe we'll get Teal Swan back in the studio, but we can have more conversations like this or we can have more how to stop male pattern baldness because we can do that too. (laughs) You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. 